apart from having the, the most beautiful voice in stormwater, uh, I'm principal environmental engineer at Ocean Protect. Uh, and I've been doing environmental engineering for over 20 years now. My two colleagues who will be joining us today, um, one being Blake Ellingham, who uh, is uh, the basically leads the charge on Ocean Protect's R&D uh, team. And there's a whole bunch of really cool stuff coming out of the R&D department. Um, and uh, certainly this is one of, the, one of the more exciting innovations that I've seen in recent times uh, in the Stormford PFAS uh, technology. And obviously... Michael Wicks will make a cameo appearance at some point uh, throughout today. Uh, Michael, for those who aren't familiar, is the director of Ocean Protect, uh, and he's been in the industry for longer than I have, uh, and heads the technical uh, shenanigans at Ocean Protect. So, welcome, gentlemen. And it has right. to be said straight from the throughout the get go, this is a really exciting technology um, for those who aren't familiar with PFAS. Um, uh, it's been described as the asbestos of the 21st century, and it's caused a whole bunch of dramas for a whole bunch of people. Uh, and long story short, Ocean Protect have developed a technology to help um, manage uh, PFAS contamination uh, in surface waters. And I and think it's a really cool, exciting innovation that's come out of uh, the R&D team. Uh, so kudos to everyone involved so far. But we recognise also there's a real a variation in the audience. So um we've got like i said about 160 registered today and it's everyone from uh junior stormwater engineers to pfas experts uh so uh, apologies if we sort of have to uh, i guess bring up a, a, provide some sort of introductory explanation as to pfas and some of the technologies um but uh i think there's something in it for everyone uh, but we'll certainly if there's something specific that you want to talk about today please put it in the Q&A uh, and ask us whatever hard question that comes to mind. And obviously, there'll be an opportunity to talk to us later if you if you want to talk offline as well. Um, but let's, let's before we start talking about the solution, let's talk about the uh, problem. Um, and look, if you are not familiar with PFAS, uh, basically, it's an acronym. Uh, it stands for per and polyfluoral alkyl substance. And it basically, it's a manufactured chemical. Uh, it's been manufactured since the 1940s, and so there's some very, very unique properties uh, in with PFAS that make it very applicable to a whole bunch of different products. And it's basically used in a stack of different products, everything from Teflon pa pans to your waterproofing uh, clothing, uh, and more commonly in aqueous firefighting uh, foams, uh, commonly seen um, in fire training and fire training um, uh, facilities training and uh training for fire fighting but also obviously the real deal um they whilst they've got some very unique properties that make it very useful chemical in terms of uh durability and wettability and 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 strength and resistance some of those properties also lend itself to being quite uh at least a, a, a contaminant of concern uh they're very persistent chemicals uh they can be quite toxic and they also are, are bioaccumulative so they basically can work their way up the food chain and basically can attach to your fatty tissues. Uh, and there are significant concerns around uh, some of the potential health implications associated with having PFAS um, contamination, whether it's be in the environment or our, our bodies. Uh, but fundamentally, it's everywhere, um, everywhere across the planet. Um, and because of, I guess, some of the concerns around its contaminant, contamination and it's uh it's ubiquitous nature and also it's potential for harm it, a lot of environmental regulators are basically taking a precautionary approach around its appropriate management so subsequently it's become a very very high priority for environmental regulators across the country in australia but also overseas and i recognize we've got a, a bunch of people uh dialing in today from overseas including the states and um libya as well which i saw just before but look, uh, for those who uh, are not familiar with some of the the media reports around PFAS, it's, it's pretty much uh, in the news a lot. Uh, now, whether that be uh, news articles, books, uh, or movies, uh, literally, probably, I think today you can watch it on Netflix. A document, uh, sorry, movie starring Mark Ruffalo, who some people might know as the Incredible Hulk. Uh, has made a movie called Dark Waters around PFAS contamination, uh, linking DuPont to a whole bunch of uh, human and uh, animal health issues um, 
in I think it was Virginia. Uh, but look, even in Australia, there's a whole bunch of media attention uh, around PFAS, specifically related to class actions associated with PFAS contamination across the country. And literally many, many sites, uh, whether it's around Darwin, Hobart, Williamtown, Oakey, you name it, um, there's various class actions and very, very expensive class actions across the country, generally associated with sites with um, uh, PFAS contamination, such as military sites and airports as well. So obviously there's a very strong concerns around human health implications, but also there's ecological health implications associated with PFAS contamination in our waterways and ocean as well. So long story short, a lot of media attention around uh, PFAS problems. Uh, if you look at just the, the Department of Defence, and this is just a snapshot from uh, the Department of Defence website around PFAS, they've got some 28 known sites of PFAS contamination and an enormous amount of money has been spent on monitoring and management um, just for military sites within Australia alone. And this doesn't include you know, various uh, legal costs, obviously, and probably potential uh, compensation pay hats as well, which can run uh, well in excess of $100 million just for one site. And it's not just a problem just uh, specific to Australia. Uh, America, for example, has many, many uh, sites of known PFAS contamination, particularly military sites, uh, and also obviously other sites, including airports, such as what we see in Australia as well. So each of those little dots has a, is, a, is a site of known PFAS contamination. Uh, and there's so lots of dots, lots of PFAS contamination. So it's a, it's a very big problem that environmental regulators are having to deal with. So subsequently... Uh, there's a whole bunch of new regulations around uh, its appropriate mo uh, management. So more recently in Australia, uh, the heads of the EPA in Australia and New Zealand have developed a, a PFAS National Environmental Management Plan, which was released a few years ago. Uh, but there's also drinking water guidelines, uh, recreational water quality guidelines, and obviously a whole bunch of legislation in the states as well. We're going to focus on mainly Australian uh, targets, but certainly there's a whole bunch of uh, increasingly stringent requirements overseas as well as in Australia. So look, there's a, as, as you probably shouldn't be surprised, there's a lot of uh, technologies and solutions associated with uh, the appropriate um, treatment and management of PFAS contamination. Uh, and so subsequently, OSHA Protect also saw a key opportunity um, for us to sort of assist with uh, helping PFAS contamination. Uh, by utilising our storm filter technology. Now, for those who aren't familiar with our storm filter technology, I'll just, what I'm going to do now is just give a very brief overview of the storm filter. But long story short, we're basically utilising the, the storm filter technology, which we've put in Australia over 30,000 sites across Australia. But we've basically tweaked the technology for to be uh, targeting, sorry, we've basically tweaked the storm filter technology to target the removal of PFAS in surface waters. Uh, so historically, storm filter has been used to treat um, typical urban stormwater pollutants, such as solids, uh, nutrients, et cetera. So for those who aren't familiar, though, it's basically an underground stormwater treatment asset. You know, stormwater can come in, the storm filter cartridges, each of those little black things are a little storm filter cartridge housing a whole bunch of absorbent me media. Water was basically uh, start ponding within the uh, chamber and the storm water is basically forced through the absorbent media where the uh, where pollutants can essentially be captured and retained uh, for subsequent removal uh, like a uh, like a swap and go bottle system for your um, gas uh, bottles um, very robust very resilient technology very flexible uh, there's a whole bunch of media options you can utilize and it's got a self-cleansing functionality as well so when the waters go down it basically activates like a scrubbing mechanism within the storm filter technology to help uh, maintain the longevity of the system. Um, so, and look, we've, we've applied these at a bunch of different sites. Generally, it's industrial sites and commercial sites and high density residential sites. Uh, they can available in a bunch of configurations, uh, whether they be in manholes, uh, in in underground chambers, etc. And it can be one or two star, uh, cartridges, or can be many, many, many cartridges, such as the one in the top right corner there. Uh, so very flexible configuration and a few different sizes as well for the storm filter. Also, it's been tested uh, to a significant extent. There's been about four real-world uh, published studies that have, have documented field-scale monitoring of the storm filter technology in the real world. Um, there's been two peer reviews on the technology, one longevity study, and a whole bunch of councils across Australia have approved their use. And all that information's on our website and on that in that uh, 
document you can see on the right hand side there uh, all publicly available and look we've installed lots of them uh, so over 27,000 installed to date in Australia and over 220,000 installed overseas uh, so they are a very widespread, very well accepted, very resilient technology. And so the the basically we're, we're looking to utilize this technology, but with a slight modification to target the, the removal of PFAS. Um, and a key change that we've made to the Stormfielder technology is the, uh, the use of a different media blend within the cartridge. So there's a few different media blends that we've already released to market, um, ZPG, PSORB, et cetera. Um, but this media that we'll look to use in the storm of PFAS technology has been developed, uh, manufactured and tested for the specific removal of PFAS in surface waters. Uh, so that solution development and testing has involved probably two key uh, aspects. Uh, so a, a bunch of lab scale testing, which I'll get Blake to talk at, uh, about first, and then a whole bunch of field scale testing to demonstrate the performance of these assets in the in the real world. Uh, so I might pass it on to Blake, if I can, please. Thanks, Brad. Right. For those of you who might not know me, I'm Blake. I've been with the Ocean Protect team for about seven years with the last five years in the research and development project manager role. If you want to go on to the next slide there, Brad. So with the in, we started investigating the... Um, we started investigating PFAS removal about three years ago with a lab scale study, a 124th scale of the storm filter. We identified six media blends, two of which were achieving 99% uh, removals of PFAS. So we selected one which was very cost effective and was able to achieve that at a high flow rate of 24 bed volumes per hour. During that test, we also tested a range of um, flow rates going all the way down to six bed volumes and we didn't see a significant improvement in terms of removal efficiency. Following on from that, our first field scale study um, we presented at the International Conference of Urban Drainage in 2021, um, which was a full-scale storm filter system where we achieved good results, but our latest study, we've um, improved the longevity fourfold. Thanks. Well, thank you, Blake. And look, before we dive into the uh, field testing, and apologies if you can hear my two little dogs barking in the background, they're excited about the storm filter PFAS technology as well. But um, one of the uh, key aspects that we've included in field scale um, testing is the integration of pretreatment. Uh, in this case, we use our uh, jellyfish uh, membrane cartridge system, basically to remove solids and organics from the incoming storm flows to help protect the storm filter PFAS and enable it uh, to uh, better remove PFAS uh, from the uh, incoming storm water flows by removing that organic and, and, and solids upstream. So for those who aren't familiar with Jellyfish, it's a membrane cartridge uh, filtration system. Uh, there's a little video I'll play here as well, basically give you some sort of insight as well. But it's very similar to the storm filter in that it's an underground tr treatment system. Um, but it's it's different in the fact that it actually uses upflow uh, a flow mechanism. So basically water comes in, uh, hits a weir, basically is forced downwards and then upwards through what we call the Jellyfish tentacles. Um, and those Jellyfish tentacles are a membrane filtration that are really good at removing uh, particulate matter and organics and uh, attached pollutants. So again, just very good at actually removing those particulate and organic matter that would otherwise uh, potentially reduce the lifespan or longevity of the storm filter PFAS technology downstream. So it's not, this technology is not targeting PFAS itself because obviously PFAS is a, a fairly difficult contaminant to remove but it's helping protect the downstream uh, storm filter PFAS technology. Um, so it uh, has a, a greater ability to remove uh, the key target, a pollutant of concern. Similar to uh, the storm filter, it's involved in, it's available in a whole bunch of different configurations, um, a whole bunch of different applications, et cetera, whether it be, and it's generally used for commercial industrial sites as well in high density residential uh, areas. And it's very common or popular for uh, sites with a low driving head in particular. Uh, again, available in a bunch of configurations, uh, online or offline, uh, whether it's one or one or two jellyfish tentacles or or many uh, cartridges. Again, very flexible design uh, available. And again, similar to storm filter, it's been tried and tested. It's been uh, the performance of these systems has been demonstrated in field scale testing, which has been published and peer reviewed uh, by others, and a whole bunch of councils across the country approve the use of. Uh, uh, jellyfish as well and all that information is publicly available on our website in that report that you can see on the right hand side 
And look, less less of these, but certainly still quite a few. Uh, over 1,300 jellyfish installations uh, have been put in the ground in Australia since 2017. Uh, and there's just a conceptual diagram showing some key features of the jellyfish. Um, might get Blake to talk about the fill scale testing as well now. Thanks, Brad. So at our test site, we had a retention pond that was collecting stormwater runoff contaminated with PFAS. From that pond, we were pumping up influent water into our 15 kiloliter tank, where it was then pumped up into our testing apparatus. As you can see there in the top schematic, um, the water would first enter into the jellyfish before cascading into the storm filter and then going through that into the holding tank before being pumped up into the effluent tank where we would await results before we either send that water into the environment or back into the retention pond. For this test, we were operating in about 24 bed volumes. Now, Brad, if you go to the next slide, you're gonna hear a lot about this bed volumes um, and it's defined by the storm filter media capacity. And this allows us to extrapolate the data depending on different flow rates and sizes of sites and also different influent um, concentrations of PFAS. So in total, we tested uh, nearly 600 bed volumes of water through the system. It was done late last year over about a two week period. We were sampling every 25 minutes, which equates to about uh, 700 litres of water per aliquot. We collected 59 aliquots across three pairs, one before the jellyfish system, one in between the jellyfish and storm filter, and one after the storm filter. In total, 17 of those aliquots across the three pairs were analysed, and we did this to reduce the analyst costs. As you all would know, PFAS is very expensive to get analysed, and we really wanted to make sure we got um, a lot of data around the key, key areas towards the end of the study. For this test, we benchmarked against the Australian drinking water guidelines with the sum of perfluorooctane sulfonic acid and perfluorohexene sulfonic acid at 0.07 micrograms per litre and for perfluorooctanoic acid, 0.56 micrograms per litre. The reason we did this is there's min minimal regulations for stormwater effluent quality of PFAS. Mm. Before, before we get into these results, um, we tested 28 analytes across four groups um, perfluoroalkyl sulfonic acids, perfluorocarboxylic acids, um, perfluoroalkyl sulfonamides, and fluorotelomer sulfonic acids, in addition to pH, fluoride, nitrate, total phosphorus, and total organic car carbon. So just to explain the graphs, on the left-hand side, you've got the PFAS concentrations in micrograms per litre. On the right-hand side, you've got the removal efficiency. The blue lines are the removal um, efficiencies across bed volumes. The green line is the influent water coming in before the jellyfish. The orange line is in between the jellyfish and the storm filter. And the navy line down the bottom is the storm filter effluent quality. You can see here up to about 500 bed volumes we're achieving 90% removal efficiency. And this is what we consider our peak performance period. For the sum of perfluorooctane sulfonic acid and perfluorohexene sulfonic acid. Again, we achieved above that 90% removal close to the 500 bed volumes. Unfortunately for these influent concentrations, we didn't meet the Australian drinking water guidelines, but with the storm filter being a modular system, not only are we able to add them in parallel, increasing the flow rate, but we can have multiple banks to allow for a series of passes to reduce that effluent concentration. For the sum of for perfluorooctanoic acid, we achieved a great result up to about 400 bedrooms of 90% where it starts to dip down. And with perfluorooctanoic acid being a PFCA, it has a tendency to um, have lower capacity um, for the removal. Now, this is where the data gets interesting for the long chain PFSAs and PFCAs. For the longer chain, we have a removal efficiency of above 85% for the full length of the field scale study. Um, this is due to the longer molecules having a decreased polarity and a preference to the sorbative media inside the storm filter. Unlike the short chain, um, which is hydrophilic and soluble, more soluble in water, so it has a preference to be in the water. And you can see around that 
400 bed volumes a steep decrease in performance um, in terms of removal efficiency. This is where Ocean Protect would typically recommend a maintenance period cycle to occur. Another thing to note is for our testing, we had a much higher concentration in influent concentrations, um, typically around um, 60 milligrams, um, 60 micrograms per litre coming in up to 100. But for other lab scale studies that we had a look at beforehand, they're testing around 0 0.2 to 0 0.8 micrograms per litre. So you might see bed volumes up to 10 or 15,000. So you just need to make, um, when comparing different thing, different tests, you need to look at the influent concentrations there. So summarising total PFAS in the peak performance period was 2 million micrograms for the cartridge and across the, the full scale, it was close to 3 million micrograms per litre with an average removal of 93%. Cool. Thank you, Blake. Uh, and look, just... It's probably... I'm just going to talk, talk very quickly about a couple of other things. So first up, likely applications. So... Look, as I've sort of probably alluded to at the start, like we see this technology or treatment train uh, being very applicable to essentially the treatment of PFAS contaminated surface waters with probably the, the likely applications being military bases, uh, airports and other areas where there's basically fire training uh, facilities. Uh, in terms of some of the key considerations, and I think Blake sort of already uh, uh, touched on some of these sort of aspects already, but just to sort of reiterate, in terms of uh, developing or designing an appropriate, uh, uh, you know, strategy for any particular site, uh, a key consideration will be the flow characteristics, particularly in relation to the PFAS concentrations and loads coming in, and also the types of PFAS uh, uh, species within that incoming flow. Different PFAS uh, particles will will be will be removed in different sort of extents. So, and obviously it's harder to uh, achieve a reduction with very lo uh, lower concentrations, but equally, uh, if you've got a, a heavily contaminated site, it means you, your system will actually have to, have to work harder and you may need to replace your cartridges more frequently. Um, another key element would be aspects that influence the removal of PFAS. And there's a whole bunch of chemical uh, qualities or chem chemical water quality indicators that do influence PFAS removal, in including P pH, fluoride, or total organic carbon and nitrogen. And also obviously the solids concentrations and loads coming in um, will very much impact on the performance of, of PFAS or any PFAS removal technology. So obviously the, the jellyfish can go a long way to removing some of those loads, but obviously you, it's a good idea to have a very good understanding of those incoming um, solids concentrations in particular. And obviously flow rates and volumes will heavily influence the size uh, and configuration of any system as well. Another key aspect, obviously, just hy site hydraulics, particularly any sort of solution that relies on the passive treatment of water. The test facility is obviously a, a pump pump arrangement to a, a, a tank, but uh, we're probably anticipating most sites will be treating uh, stormwater flow that's gravity flowing through uh, an area. Uh, Blake's also alluded to the fact that, you know, the water quality objectives can vary from site to site, you know, whether it's drinking water targets or non-detect or some sort of percentage reduction, that'll influence the ultimate design and configuration. And fundamentally, last but not least, is the operation and maintenance. Like any assets, these, these technologies, this treatment train will need to be appropriately maintained. Now, uh, the operation and maintenance requirements of the jellyfish and storm footer PFAS are similar to our standard jellyfish and storm footer technologies, but different recognizing the potential, the nature of the contaminant that we're dealing with PFAS and it's associated, uh, you know, high risk uh, human health uh, consequences. So we've actually had a, a operation maintenance and storm um, and swims um, safe work safe work uh, method statements developed independently of Ocean Protect. They've actually been developed by uh, an independent third party um, consultancy in Optimal Stormwater. Who, for those who aren't familiar, uh, have developed the Storm New South Wales operation maintenance guidelines as well. Uh, so that's probably another key advantage of our of our treatment train approach. Uh, but amongst other advantages, I think the, probably the main one is the fact that we can provide a turnkey solution to a PFAS uh, problem at any particular site. So OSHA Protect can do the design, the installation and the management of the technologies, but also we've got a significant uh, body of expertise and equipment uh, for remote uh, water quality monitoring. And that'll probably be a key aspect of any sort of uh, PFAS treatment uh, solution at any particular site. 
it obviously can treat water passively, as I indicated, so not necessarily a pump arrangement, but basically can, can uh, possibly uh, rely on just essentially the, the passive movement, relying on gravity alone uh, of water through any particular site. A key advantage is obviously the fact that these solutions can be integrated uh, quite easily underground, which will be a key attractive feature for particularly military sites and airport sites where there's uh, concerns around lines, lines of sight and other sort of potential above ground hazards. So fundamentally, these devices can be integrated underground. Now, the other advantage of the of the storm filter solution is that if if additional treatment is required, we can basically just have additional storm filter cartridges in series. So depending on your water quality objective, uh, you can run it through just one set of storm filter cartridges. But if you need to provide an additional layer of polishing or or PFAS concentration reductions, you can go through two, three, or four, or whatever uh, banks of uh, storm filter technologies. Uh, I guess the key things, obviously, in terms of cost, it, it, generally people want to know how much it is. Um, but we've done, look, long, long story short, cost will vary from site to site. Uh, but we've done some comparisons against uh, sites that we're aware, uh, that we're familiar with, uh, and looked at what's currently being, uh, you know, done on site and what the associated costs are, and what we could basically do as an alternative. And Ocean Protects uh, treatment train approach. In integrating the jellyfish and storm filter PFAS technology is generally about half of what the costs are for alternative or conventional technologies. So yeah, we think roughly we'll probably be about half the cost uh, relative to typical uh, treat PFAS treatment technologies, which is obviously going to be a, an attractive feature for uh, site owners and managers. Look, that's all we wanted to present today, um, but we certainly welcome if you've got any uh, questions, and I can see a stack have already come through. Uh, if you've got uh, a question that you'd like to ask us today, please uh, put it in the Q&A. Uh, obviously, we'll do our best to get through as many as we can. Um, obviously, our contact details are on the screen as well. Uh, and if you've got any sort of, uh, if you'd like to talk to us further uh, following on from today, feel free to reach out to us directly. Um, but look at what I might do first up is just run through each of these questions first in best dressed. Um, are we are we okay with that, gentlemen? Oh, look, a very early question uh, was from John Burgess and John's asked a few questions. So, uh, everyone's favorite question is, uh, at least John's, have you guys got squid at verification for this filter? Michael, do you want to have a first pass crack at this and I'll, I might follow on? Yes, a very simple answer, Brad. That's no, even though our application's been in for three of our elite technologies since January 2022. You didn't mishear me, that was January 2022. So we're past sort of 15 months of waiting. So no, we don't. And um, I think anyone's guess is as good as mine is when we'll actually see an approval, unfortunately. Yeah, yeah. look, and, and obviously that's for our storm filter piece orb technology and and that's our standard storm filter uh, configuration. But if, if we, we haven't done anything associated with Squidep for the storm filter PFAS technology, which is which is a different uh, filter. I don't think we did bother going through the squid at verification pro progress uh, process, recognizing that um, most state bodies don't endorse it. Uh, but also, our clients in this space don't care about squid at verification. Uh, we're looking to take this data and basically publish it in a, an appropriate um, a journal paper very shortly. Um, but so we're not going to. I, I wouldn't have thought we'd bother with squid at verification for the stormfield PFAS technology anytime soon. Uh, another question from John. Uh, so do you need to replace the filters after 500 bed volumes? Blake, did you want to have a crack at this one or? Yeah, thanks, John, for the question. So the as I stated before, the 500 bed volumes, that's for that concentration between 60 to 100 micrograms per litre. It's very dependent on the site characteristics. If you have one microgram per litre coming in, you're gonna you, the cartridges are going to last a lot longer. So it's really dependent from site to site and getting an understanding before we implement one of these systems about how many storm filters we need and if we need multiple banks. And look, just further to that, Brad, as part of the testing, you know, whether it be bench scale, 
um, also field testing. We've done a couple of field tests on this now and Blake's presenting the results of the second one, but we've tested um, multiple different influent concentrations. So, you know, part of this test was really about look, looking at longevity, but also performance at different concentrations because we previously, te previously tested much lower concentrations where, as Blake alluded to, the cartridge lasts a lot longer. So we've got good understanding around longevity now, and we also um, have great understanding about performance as well. Yeah, and just, just continuing on from that. So the laboratory scale was done between sort of 0.8 to 1 micrograms per litre. The initial field scale study was done in the range of one to five micrograms per litre. And this was done from sort of 60 to 100 micrograms per litre of influent concentration for total PFAS. You're muted. Thanks, Blake. Uh, another question from John is, how do you go with occupational health and safety when maintaining the filters? Isn't that dangerous? Great question. This is probably the number one concern that we had right from the get-go is that we're dealing with a, a very potentially very, very nasty contaminant and we're removing it from stormwater flows, but obviously it's still being retained within technologies that someone has to potentially uh, look to remove and, and appropriately dispose of later on. Um, so that's why I think I'm referred to, we've taken, we've sorry, engaged with an independent third party consultant in Optimal Stormwater to develop operation and maintenance uh, guidelines for our filters uh, and appropriate uh, safe work uh, method statements for, for the same um, maintenance activities as well. Uh, but long story short, it is similar to our uh, typical maintenance procedures for storm filter and jellyfish, but recognizing the the very potentially nasty nature associated with the contaminant of concern. Um, uh, one one a couple of key differences, for example, is uh, we we don't manually handle the the cartridges or or, or, or sorry, in both the storm filter and jellyfish. We take a sample of the of the cartridge media within the storm filter and based on and so obviously send that off to a lab and then reseal the cartridge. When we get the lab results back, we can decide well uh, based on the regulatory requirements uh, where to send that storm filter cartridge. Now if it's below if if the PFAS contamination off the top of my head if it's below 50 milligram per kilogram, we can dispose of the cartridge uh, in uh, in an appropriate landfill facility. If it's above 50 milligram per kilogram, uh, it has to go somewhere else for appropriate destruction and management or, or similar. Um, so it is a bit different, but we don't look to replace the filter media either. Uh, within the storm filter, well, like we would normally do for a um, a typical application, you know, suck the media out, repurpose the cartridge, and 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 use it for somewhere else. Basically, the the media, if sorry, if the cartridge do does need to be replaced at some point, we basically pick up the media after it's been tested, etc. Pick up the um, the entire cartridge, leave it in its form appropriately, uh, enclose it in an appropriate container, and then put it in an appropriate sort of um, transport uh, tr uh, uh, trans. Uh, uh, like a truck or whatever and dispose of it appropriately. Uh, so there's a bunch of stuff like that um, that go a long way to mitigating the any sort of potential risks associated with the, the maintenance. All of that's documented in O&M guidelines, um, which we haven't publicly released just yet, um, but we will be doing so very, very shortly. Uh, so I hope that answers your question, John, but obviously there's a whole lot more detail in the O&M guidance material and SWMSs as well. And, and look, watch this space on that as well. As we get into this more, we'll be looking at different procedures um, and techniques that will further reduce our cost base in regard to that. You're right, it is dangerous. Um, yep. So we've taken a very cautionary approach at this stage, but that will change in the future. Cool. Daniel Niven from Engineer asks the question, uh, does the jellyfish capture PFAS tied up in the material that is focused on capturing to protect the storm carts? Yeah, great question. I'm going to go back to one of the graphs that Blake showed at the um, start, so or in the middle. So you can see this is the uh, graph of PFAS contamination. So just to repeat Daniel's questions in relation to, you know, does a jellyfish basically capture PFAS as well? Um, you can see this is the, 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 the green or the cyan line shows the... Uh, uh, PFAS concentrations in water coming into the jellyfish and the orange basically shows the PFAS concentrations leaving the jellyfish and then going into the storm filter. So you can see that's the PFAS concentrations in green coming in, orange going out. And you can see there basically that the jellyfish doesn't do anything to significantly remove uh, PFAS uh, concentrations at all. It's the same thing for the other sort of PFAS indicators as well. 
So we're not expect expecting that the jellyfish basically does much at all in terms of PFAS removal. And that's kind of expected because there's no real treatment processes uh, provided by the, the membrane cartridge system that it does anything to really remove uh, PFAS in any significant quantities. Yeah, the, Brad, the, the, the purpose of the jellyfish in this field scale study was more that treatment train mm. approach where we're trying to increase the longevity of the storm filter meet PFAS media and um, allow it to achieve a, a maximum absorptive capacity. Um, building upon the previous study, we got a four, 4x increase in absorptive capacity to the media by implementing that jellyfish um, Cool. Uh, Daniel also asks these uh, up to ninety percent reductions discussed. Is this a load reduction or a concentration reduction? Uh, it's a. It's a. They, these are concentration reductions shown here. Uh, John Burgess, another question. Uh, have you tested the multi-pass treatment and the efficiencies that you just said, Brad? Not as yet. Um, we've done a, a bunch of testing, but not to date. Uh, looking at. Um, uh, multi-pass systems. But like Michael indicated, we've tested the performance of these assets uh, at different influent concentrations. Um, so and, that's, uh, pretty, yeah, you got Michael. Yeah, and that was, that was one of the reasons why we, we were looking at about that 60 micrograms coming in. We, we knew we were knocking down to five because the test before the second test that we did, not presented here, as Blake said, was sort of like one to five, one to six micrograms a litre. So we knew what the concentrations, you know, are at the effluent quality of this test. So... Whilst we haven't done it and run it around in circles, we know we have a very strong understanding of what the likelihood of results would be. Mm. A question from Daniel uh, uh, Niven again. Uh, most release criteria stipulated by the regulatory authorities are a specific concentration. Does the treatment train achieve a background concentration? Um, it, it depends on what you, you, I think what Daniel is asking, like obviously the, the, the target concentration will vary from site to site uh, and that'll be very much uh, dependent on a bunch of stuff. Um, but in terms of, is there, a, is there a background concentration as to below which we can't expect to achieve any PFAS removal? Like you'd expect to say in like a wetland or a swale has a C star um, background concentration. Have, have we encountered, the question for you guys, have we encountered a, a C star or a background concentration, a concentration of PFAS below which we can't really achieve? Anything lower than? No, from the lab scale studies that we did with the lower influent concentrations, we were getting right down to non detects across all the analytes. Mm. So if it is a background, if there is a background concentration, it'll probably be uh, below the detectable limit, basically. So hopefully that answers your question, Daniel. Uh, Sean Halpin asks, can the media be regenerated? Area for further research, but not at the moment. Mm-hmm. A um, question from Rebecca Malaj. Uh, have you got data on the lifespan of the carbon filters in the storm filter and replacement requirements? Who would like to have a crack at responding to that one? Yeah, look, you... this, is, this is effectively what we've done with this study. Um, <laughs> you know, we, we looked at all the replacements. We looked at the number of bed volumes did for a given concentration. We know the sorptive capacity of the media. So, yes. We know what the lifespan of the filter is for a certain, you know, influent concentration and volume throughput, because we know where the breakthrough is or where the performance starts to drop off. Um, so yeah, we have all that data sort of available, multiple concentrations coming in. Cool. Um, Shane Dave asks, uh, approximately what percentage of the is it cost effective compared to treating the contaminated runoff? Uh, separately slash conventional methods. I think he's asking how does the cost compare of of this system relative to a conventional approach? As, as I sort of indicated before, it's the, from the sites that we've looked at and recognizing costs will vary from site to site. It's generally uh, the the uh, the stormwater treatment train approach using jellyfish and storm filter is generally about half of of the cost associated with a conventional uh, alternative approach. Um, but look, if you're after a specific uh, quotation and you want to do a cost comparison, what, what your best option is basically to approach us directly and we can provide you a, a free, no obligation quote uh, for a solution for any particular site. Because it, uh, it's all going to come down to your influent concentration and your goals, how many passes you're doing, whether you're putting that side by side with some sort of deten detention or attenuation or your testing requirements. It's not just a 
plug and play stormwater treatment device that someone spits a number out in music. Um, it's a little bit more complicated than that, but because the system's modular, it's relatively easy for us to work out. If you know what your site's producing and what your goals are, we can give you a number relatively easily. Cool. I've got a few more questions. A uh, question from Michael uh, asks, any solutions for PFAS attenuation in soil? No. We're focusing on no. soil. Uh, <laughs> We've only got four guys in R&D, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I think, I think sometimes people um, uh, don't recognise that Ocean Protect's reasonably small, uh, can't solve all the world's problems, although we like to try. Uh, but certainly focusing on water treatment uh, for the time being uh, and not getting into soil management and remediation just yet. But watch this space. We'll see. Um, Mark Ferreira asks, how often, how often would you need to maintain this product? Most councils prefer a five-year maintenance frequency. I think, I think sort of Blake sort of covered this in a fair bit of detail already, but it, it really will depend on the incoming pollutant loads and the targets that you need to achieve as well. Um, look, we can give a ballpark figure. I think Blake's indicated for this particular influent concentration, this particular flow rate, it was uh, after about 500 bed volumes. And now what that means on any particular site will vary. It could be every six months. It could be every two years, every three years. Who knows? Blake, did you want to have a further comment on that? Uh, the only thing that I would probably comment on is that the typical storm filter media is sort of the maintenance period is sort of anywhere from 12 months to two years. And that would be something that we'd be trying to achieve mm. within that vicinity when we're designing these systems. Yeah. It, look, it's really going to depend on your, on your solar load as well. Um, obviously, if there's a low solar load and there's not too many competing pollutants, yeah, you could design a system up for five years if you wanted to. Um, so you touch it infrequently. That's if you wanted to. Um, but again, depending on you know, the concentration and all of the competing pollutants. That's the sort of main criteria what's going to govern. But if you wanted six month maintenance, we can do that. If you wanted two years, we could do that. As long as you know a lot about your site, we can fairly accurately predict from all the data we've got on how often it'll be maintained. And it's really then just a balance between capital and maintenance costs, um, but we can also lease the technology as well. So if you wanted a service inclusive lease for the technology, um, we can do that too. I'm on mute again. Um, a question from Peter. Uh, Peter asks, does the PFAS storm filter cartridge operate or function differently to the conventional storm filter uh, used for standard stormwater runoff? How different is it? Is it basically the same? Do you want to answer that, Mike? Oh, it's a, yeah, look, sure. Um, look, it's, it's, we've changed a lot of parts out or a few parts out of the filters. So the, um, the jellyfish itself is relatively straightforward and the same, but the storm foot has had a few parts changed out um, together with the media as well has been worked on. So it's not, you can't just take a standard piece of storm footer and say, hey, can this remove PFAS too? Because it won't. So there has been certainly some changes and that was part of, um, you know, Ocean Protects R&D department looking at different types of media blends, not just for PFAS, also but for ammonium, ortho P, nitrate, um, and other pollutants are concerned as well, and together with our Filterra technology. So this has really been about a, a journey for us um, in changing the media for the past, you know, sort of six, eight years, working with different types of media filters and types of media themselves. Cool. Um, John also asks again, what is the actual treatment pathway slash process within the storm filter media? What's the secret? How is PFAS getting removed from storm water, uh, from the stormwater flows coming through the media? Michael, you might be best to answer this one, maybe. So it's just absorption. You know, adsorption to the surface of the media. Sorptive capacity. That's what it is. That's why we have the, the membrane filter up front to basically to keep the longevity of the available sites for absorption. So um, and to reduce those competing pollutants. And no different, not dissimilar to what you'd see with um, allen based filter media, um, uh, iron based filter media, you know, zeolites as well, you know, cation exchange or sorptive capacity. Um, that's effectively what's happening in there. Uh, another question Can you pump and treat contaminated groundwater or aquifers? Yes. Uh, is, is Ocean Protect a publicly listed company? No. <laughs> <laughs> Another question, random. Uh, sorry, Darren uh, C. C. Bomb um, uh, asks, what would be the maximum flow rate through the filter? I guess you're talking about a specific 
single storm filter cartridge? Yep. Yeah, so a single storm filter cartridge is just under half a litre a second um, per cartridge. So we've kept it the same as our standard piece of flow rate. And so if you think about that, it's fairly, it's a, it's a reasonably high flow rate for a standard sort of 460 cartridge. So we could get the taller cartridge, obviously 50% higher than that. Um, so if you looked at 100 cartridges, yeah, you'd be about 50 litres a second treatable flow rate, um, removing more than 90% PFAS, which is pretty significant sort of effort in this sort of space. We don't need the super low, um, you know, super low flow rates and extended contact times. We basically played and looked at the contact time versus bed depth versus particle size and solved that problem. That's the results you see here and now. Cool. I have one more question left. So if if you've got any burning question you'd like to ask Michael or Blake or myself, uh, feel free to put it in the Q&A before we have to close up proceedings. But uh, the last question I have listed is Cameron Slack asks, um, what are the limits of reporting for analysis on your discharges? Queensland, uh, 0.00023 microgram per uh, litre target has effluent. Has effluent been tested to these limits? Yep. So for your perfluorooctanoic acid, perfluorosulfonic acid, um, so perfluorooctanoic octane sulfonic acid and perfluorohexane sulfonic acid, they go down to the 0.0002. Um, some of the analytes are a little bit higher at 0.0005. So just depending on the specific analyte, obviously we tested 28 analytes across the four groups. Cool. Hey, thanks everyone for the, uh, oh, I've got one more. Um, can the, can, one last final question from Darren uh, asks, can the, can the, can it basically be scaled up with more filters? So we've talked about the half a litre per second, but can you basically just scale that up to with lots of different filters, basically. If, if you want a thousand filters, just um, send your email through to inquirizationprotect.com.au. <laughs> I'm sure there's somebody more than happy to help you out with that. But yeah, to answer your question, yes, absolutely. That's a whole lot. That's basically how storm filter cartridges have been integrated. Um, you know, lots, lots of uh, cartridges can be installed underground for sure yeah. uh, to cater for high flow rates. Um, so, Brad, just to wrap up on that, in case Darren missed it, um, not only can we scale up the flow rate, but we can also increase the removal concentration by having a series of banks of storm filters. Right, great point. Uh, look, uh, if you've got any further questions you'd like to put forward to Blake or Michael or myself, please reach out. We're more than happy to help out. Um, I know this is a fairly new innovation, so I know it's a fair bit to get your head around. So, if you'd like us to sort of provide a bit more further detail, just drop us a line. Um, again, the uh, recording and slides will be made available on the Ocean Protect website probably within 24 hours. Uh, but if uh, if you'd like to reach out again, just feel free to do so. Thank you to the two uh, my two esteemed colleagues for presenting today, uh, and particularly well done to Blake for handling all those big words uh, and, and big acronyms. Uh, so well big done. Big tongue twisters. <laughs> That's right. And thank you everyone for uh, dialing in today. Really popular uh, session and uh, uh, your appreciate your attendance is certainly uh, greatly appreciated. So thank you so much and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thanks guys. See you later. Thank you. Thanks Brad. Bye.